Hello, everyone. So I will first want to start by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me to give this, uh, this talk. And I'm uh, sorry that I could not take the opportunity to visit India, but I hope that I will be able to do it again in the future. OK, so uh, this talk is about supersymmetric dark matter. So just a very brief uh, introduction on uh, why we believe there's dark matter. It's actually the evidence for dark matter have been mounting for uh, many years, and now we have strong evidence from many scales. So I'll just give a few examples. At the galactic scale, there, there have been observation of rotation curve of galaxy showing that the velocity uh, increase or rather reach a plateau when you get far away from the center. Whereas if all the matter in the galaxy would be concentrated where the luminous matter is, you would expect the velocity to drop. There's also at the scale of galaxy clusters, there are many evidence that there is more matter than what actually uh, emits light. And this has been shown by gravitational lensing and by calculation of mass to light ratio from for already more than uh, 80 years. But the very, very precise determination of uh, the amount of dark matter came from observation of cosmological scales. And basically, dark matter is required to amplify this very tiny fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background in order to form a large scale structure in the universe today. So the very precise measurement of the uh, cosmic microwave background by first WMAP and now Planck has shown very small temperature fluctuation and a careful study of this spectrum of these temperature fluctuation allows to put constraints on the cosmological model, the total amount of matter, the total amount of baryonic matter, as well as other quantities. And it has allowed to determine very precisely how much uh, is the relic density of dark matter today? And actually the number, as you can see here, is around 0.1 with a very high precision. And actually uh, the matter content of the universe is dominated by dark matter, not by ordinary matter. Hence this raised the question, is dark matter form of a new particle? And if so, what are its properties? Well, this, although this measurement of the relic density of dark matter is very precise, it still leaves lots of possibilities for dark matter of different mass and interaction strength, each varying by many, many orders of magnitude. So actually in the last century, we had a very good idea what would be this new particle. And this new particle was the neutralino and supersymmetry as we will see later. Why was that? It was not because of dark matter observation only, because dark matter just observation just told us that there would be some amount of non-luminous matter in the universe, but didn't tell us much about its properties. The reason was rather that at the time, supersymmetry was the prime candidate for physics beyond the standard model, because it had very some very nice feature. First of all, it had a symmetry that allowed to relate fermion and boson. It solved the hierarchy problem of the Higgs. It allowed for coupling of unification, therefore paved the way for a, a unified theory. And it could eventually be connected with uh, supergravity. So there was all this activity on uh, supersymmetry from the particle physics point of view. And moreover, because in these supersymmetric model, it was uh, there was a proposal to introduce a parity, which is called R parity. And this was actually necessary to guarantee the stability of the proton. Well, it turns out that if this uh, parity is introduced where all standard model particles are even and all supersymmetric particles are odd, it means that the lightest supersymmetric particle could not decay. So this gave a perfect weak scale neutral stable particle it just came out as, as for free. It was not built in, in the model to explain dark matter. So this is a, always a nice feature of supersymmetric dark matter. And that, that because this candidate exists, 
there was this from the theoretical to, theoretical size side and it had the right property for dark matter as we will see in a minute then uh, people start to think of dark matter as the neutralino now the the field has uh, enlarged a lot i mean there are many more possibilities for dark matter but still what i would want to discuss in this uh, these two lectures is what is left for uh, uh, supersymmetric dark matter one other good thing about super symmetric dark matter or WIMP dark matter in general is there's a clear path for searching for it because there are basically three different ways and we will see in a second for searching for dark matter, direct and indirect search and production at colliders that would in principle allow to uh, find out these new particle and to uh, extract its property. The only drawback is that in supersymmetry, there's a very large parameter space. So after many years of active search and no confirmed signal of dark matter or of no new physics for that, for, that, for that matter, we then still have to ask the question, what is the status of supersymmetric dark matter? And where is this supersymmetric dark matter hiding if it's the correct dark matter candidate? So the outline of the lectures will be as follow. We'll first discuss on very general terms, what are the characteristics of dark matter candidates? And in particular, what is the relic density? And I will also discuss more, more specifically uh, dark matter observable as known as direct detection. And then we'll see uh, what it means for neutralino dark matter in the minimal uh, supersymmetric model. Then I will discuss uh, neutrino dark matter in extension of the minimal model. And I will also discuss another possible candidate of dark matter in supersymmetry, which is this neutrino dark matter, which typically require extent, also extensions of the minimal model. And I will end with comments on indirect detection. So in the first, in actually most of the talk, I will consider dark matter a new weakly interacting massive particle. Although when I do discuss this neutrino, I will also discuss the possibility that dark matter is not weakly interacting, but feebly interacting. Okay, so let's start with weakly interacting massive particle as dark matter. So this is definitely the most uh, stable uh, hypothesis. So why is that? Why are WIMP good dark matter candidates? Basically, it all comes down to the fact that in these models, we can calculate the relic density and it turns out to be more or less okay. So what is, the, uh, what is going on for uh, relic density of, of the WIMP? Well, in the early universe at very high temperature, WIMPs are abundant. Dark matter, which I will denote by chi, are relative sticks and they are in intermolecular beam with other particles. Basically, it means that they're rapidly annihilating into standard model particles and vice versa. And also they can interact with standard model uh, particle just um, through the scattering process. So their density is basically the equilibrium density of all standard model particles and it's proportional to T, T cube. Now, as the universe expands, the temperature drops. In this plot here, we sh this is the inverse temperature. So here the temperature drops, but eventually it drops below the mass of dark matter. It means that the production rate is suppressed, meaning that the particle in plasma do not have sufficient thermal energy to produce a pair of dark matter particle. So this uh, dark matter start to decouple and it can basically after that on only annihilate. Eventually, this rate of annihilation drops below the expansion rate of the universe. It means that there's not enough uh, neutralino for annihilation. And they fall out of equilibrium and freeze out. So this is what happens at this time. So basically, at this point, the production of WIMPs ceased. And their number density, given here by n, is only uh, driven by the expansion rate of the universe, h. Now, when this freeze out occur, depends on the strength of the interaction between uh, dark matter and standard model particle. The stronger they interact, the later they uh, decouple and the smaller, uh, the smaller number uh, is le left over. 
So the temperature where this actually happens, this freeze out is about the mass of the dark matter over, over 20. And the equation that governs the evolution of the number density is given here. And it basically corresponds to the first term would be the depletion of WIMP due to their annihilation. And then the second term is the reverse process, the creation of WIMP from a standard model, which have a number density, which is the equilibrium number density. In this equation, we also have H with the Hubble uh, expansion rate. So typically, uh, instead of solving this equation, we will rather write it in terms of the abundance, which is the number density divided by the entropy. And this is uh, the, um, the equation that one has to solve, uh, typically numerically, and uh, evaluate the abundance today. And this gives us the value, which is, has to be compared with the value measured by uh, WMAP, the omega h square which is just the mass of dark matter, the entropy today, the abundance today, and the uh, critical density. Well, if you plug in the numbers, it, you end up with the relic density, which is proportional to 3 times 10 to minus 27, divided by sigma v. And a cross section of about 3 times 10 to minus 26 will give you just, oops, just the right amount of, um, of uh, relic density. What is interesting is that for a, a, a WIMP, and if you just plug in the number for a WIMP interacting at the electrophysical scale, what a typical process of wing interaction with exchange of a particle going into standard model particle and the strength of the interaction be, being G, the weak coupling, and just plug this in, you get that the sigma V is proportional to G4 over mass of the dark matter square. So for 100 uh, GV and the typical wind coupling, you end up with 3 to 10 to minus 26, or a cross-section about one picobar. So just the right number that you need to get omega about 0.1. So this is a remarkable uh, co coincidence. And uh, this, this has been called the wind miracle, basically, because the particle physics independently predicts particles that have the right property to be the dark matter with the right value for the relic density. I should say, right now that this is a simple estimate. It is based on uh, the fact that this would be the dominant annihilation process. In real life, we will see in other examples that we can have variations by uh, orders of magnitude in a uh, cert certain case. But certainly this motivated, this coupled with the knowledge that we had at the time on uh, supersymmetry, certainly motivated the fact that uh, neutralino on supersymmetry would be a prime candidate for a WIMP. Just a word about uh, miracles with this citation of Einstein. Uh, I personally think that nothing is a miracle, but up to you to believe or not as that matter as a miracle. In any case, if dark matter is a WIMP, there's a clear way to probe this nature of dark matter. Basically, because all observables that we have can be determined by the interaction of the WIMPs with standard model particle, and they are specified in a given uh, particle physics model. So I just sh showed you that to compute the relic density, you had to compute the annihilation cross-section for WIMPs into uh, dark matter particles. Similarly, if you look at uh, WIMP's annihilation in the galaxy today, you can see indirectly the uh, evidence for dark matter because these WIMP will annihilate into, uh, for example, a positron or antipotron or photons, and you can search for these. So this also, this observable will also depends on the annihilation of dark matter into standard model. If you look in the other direction, Dark matter can also interact with quark and gluon in the nucleon. And looking for a nucleus recall, you can see evidence, direct evidence of dark matter hitting a nuclei. So this basically depends on the same new physics, although uh, you look in the other direction. 
And finally, the third way is to use colliders because you can start with standard model particles. So for PP collider, it will be quark and gluon and produce dark matter accompanying with uh, one or more new particle. So all of, so basically by these three methods, there is a hope that one can not only discover dark matter, but of course, understand its properties and determine its property and uh, learn about the new physics that is behind. It will turns out that uh, nowadays some of the strongest uh, constraint on dark matter comes from direct detection. So let me take a few minutes to discuss direct detection first in general terms for WIMPs, and then we'll see how these apply to uh, the neutralino and supersymmetry. So direct detection is the elastic scattering of WIMPs of nuclei in a large detector that is hidden deep on the ground to block the um, uh, cosmic ray signals. And what one uh, measure is the nuclear recoil energy. So you have, uh, we're surrounding a wind of dark matter. It, it can hit the nucleus and uh, elastically scatter. And what is observed is, is, it is the tiny recoil energy of the nucleus is of the order of a, a few hundred kilo electron volt. So this is definitely the best way to prove that WIMPs form dark matter. From the particle physics side, side, the fact that this interaction occurs at very small energy, it's possible actually to write generic interaction and write effective Lagrangians for WIMP nucleon and with quark amplitude at small momentum transfer. Typic the typical momentum transfer is given by the uh, dark matter velocity, which is about 1,000th of the speed of light the mass and then the reduced mass of dark matter and the nucleon. And if you substitute that for, uh, for example, a xenon uh, nucleon, a nucleus, you end up with a momentum transfer about 100 MeV. So just to give you an example for Majorana fermion, which is the case for neutralino, this actually effective Lagrangian is very simple. You have basically uh, one possible type of interaction, which is scalar type of interaction, and another one, which is a gamma mu gamma five type of interaction. The first one is the only one that contributes to spin independent interaction on nucleus, and the second one to spin dependent interaction in nucleus. So the first one is basically dominated by Higgs exchange with uh, Higgs uh, interacting with quarks or gluon in the nucleus. You can, in principle, have a contribution also from squark exchange in supersymmetry, although because squarks are tend to be heavier, they're usually subdominant. And you are also have interactions that will contribute for spin dependent, for example, through the exchange of a Z. There's also a contribution for squark for this spin dependent interaction. But you see that whatever is the underlying the particle physics model, once you assume that dark matter is a major and a fermion, you have a limited number of operator and all the new physics can be described in these effective coupling here that characterizes spin independent or spin dependent operator. Of course, this is not what is measured. What is measured is a rate uh, for uh, interaction as a function of the energy. And it depends not only on these coefficient of the Lagrangian that I have just described, but also on a nuclear form factor, on the de local density of dark matter, and on the dark matter velocity distribution. For easy comparison between experiment, uh, typically it is assumed that uh, the neutron and the proton interaction are identical. If the, if the interaction is dominated by Higgs, this is typically the case. And there is that there is a Maxwell Boltzmann velocity distribution. And the, I have not written here the parameters, but they are, they are, there's a convention for what are the value for these Maxwell Boltzmann cup parameters. If this, under this assumption, everything can be in, expressed in terms of the uh, uh, interaction of dark matter on proton. So it means that no matter what is the uh, nucleus you're using, whether it's xenon, whether it's germanium, what, whether it's uh, high sodium iodine, everything is brought back into the space of uh, dark matter interaction with protons. I forgot to say here, there is some issue on how to write these effective couplings because they can be calculated for 
for WIM to quark, they have to tr be translated to WIM to nucleon. So there are coefficients that can make this, trans this translation, but there, are, there, there is an uncertainty on these and it is often forgotten. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the numbers, uh, there have been really, really a very active uh, search for uh, dark matter through their spin independent uh, interaction with nucleus. So as I said, in this case, it's basically dominated by Higgs exchange. And you see that over the years, the sensitivity has increased by many order of magnitudes. And even I show on the left, the, the slide that that compares the results for uh, many different experiments. The best one at the time was given by Xenon 1 ton for masses above uh, 10 GeV. It has just very recently been um, improved by um, Panda X, which also uh, uh, is also a Xenon detector. And you see the red line here, which is slightly better than uh, the black line. And you also see on these figure that at some point when you get to lower mass, you lose sensitivity. Well, it's because a very light dark matter just had, and at, at a very non-relativistic just don't have enough energy to um, pass the threshold for the, for the detector. To give enough energy for, to the nucleus to, so that it passed the threshold for the detector. But this, there are plans to actually uh, improve the capabilities to search for dark matter down to the GV scale and even a little bit below. So this is just to give a, you an order of magnitude of the current limit. We will see example what means in supersymmetry later. We will also see one example where um, the spin independent interaction become, uh, become uh, important. And basically, that's for spin independent interaction, there are results for also xenon one ton, uh, which is sensitive to spin dependent interaction and nucleon, and PICO, which is, uh, works with uh, uh, fluorine, and it is uh, sensitive to spin independent interaction with a proton. Uh, Professor Belarche? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. There is a question. Uh, yes. which was actually about uh, this neutrino float that you actually yes. showed. Yeah, so someone is, uh, Alpuna uh, is asking, what is neutrino floor in the left? Okay, so for, for um, if, uh, basically there are neutrino, basically when, when, when uh, the cross-section is uh, so small, you cannot make the difference between uh, dark matter and neutrinos neutrinos that come from the sun, for example. So at this point, the conventional uh, uh, direct detection um, experiments uh, lose all their sensitivity to dark matter. So there are projects to uh, actually, these are called directional detectors, where you can actually reconstruct the direction of your signal that would allow to bite into this neutrino floor region. Okay, so these were just in general what could be done uh, for WIMP. Let me now come back to, uh, uh, we will move to supersymmetry soon, but I just want to give you an idea of how constraining uh, these two measurements, the measurement of the relic density and the upper limit on the direct detection cross-section can be in a, in a very simple model. So let me consider the case, which is similar to what we will have in supersymmetry, where we have a fermion dark matter that interacted with the Higgs, and that's all. So there is a coupling of, of dark matter to the Higgs, and requiring that you reproduce the relic density of 0.1 basically tells you what is this coupling. So this is the black line here, which is a constant at high mass. And then you have this region where uh, it can be much lower. The reason for that here is that in this region, the dark matter mass is very close to half the mass of the Higgs. So it's the cross section has a factor of uh, in the denominator total energy minus mass of the Higgs square, but since the um, 
the dark matter is, is non relativistic It's basically for m chi square over m h square. So you see that when the mass is just half the mass of the Higgs, there's a huge enhancement of the cross section. Therefore, one needs a much smaller coupling at this particular value of the mass. Okay, so this is what we would need to get the correct relic density. And you see the region that is currently excluded by xenon one ton. And for high dark matter mass, you see that there's really uh, several, uh, there's more than one order of magnitude exclusion. So this simple model is just completely include, excluded by the common requirement of relic density and, uh, and direct detection, except for this very tiny region where uh, the, the coupling can be smaller because there is this re resonance and enhancement when you look at relic density. Of course, there's no resonance for the direct detection process. So this is just to give you an idea that there are really uh, these, these two observables are really uh, in tension. And we will see later that in supersymmetry, we can get out of this strong correlation, basically because the model is more uh, involved more particle and you can have additional processes that, co that contribute, for example, to the relic density and those processes don't necessarily uh, uh, take place with uh, direct detection. Professor Belarge, there yes. is another uh, uh, question uh, yes. from Ovishek. He wants to know that uh, how we are getting this annihilation paths since uh, we do not know much about the dark matter. No, no, this is this is I'm I'm here assuming a specific model where I just have I just take the standard model, I add a new fermion, which a coupling given by the, the value here, lambda h chi chi, and that's it. So within a specific model, I know exactly how to calculate the relic density. I just don't know what is the value of this coupling, but since there is a unique coupling, the um, uh, imposing omega equal 0.11 tells me exactly what is this coupling as a function of the mass of, of, of the dark matter. And this is this black line that we see here. OK. Um, okay, so I just wanted to make a few statements uh, again about this correlation about relic density, which does put strong constraints on combination of on mass and couplings, especially if you have a very simple model with only a few parameters. And then you can ask the question, will any weakly interacting particle would lead to this miracle? And in more general term, is it possible to relax this strong correlation between relic density and dark matter? Okay, so we've already seen an example where uh, there is a possibility to relax this correlation. And this is the case where you have resonance and annihilation. This is a very common case in, in, in many of the new physics model, you have a new mediator that can possibly be on resonance depending on your choice of the parameter. <coughs> I'm sorry, on the parameter the mass parameter of the, um, of the mediator. Here it's the Higgs, so it's fixed, and the mass of the dark matter. It's also uh, possible that there are many channels that are involved in the relic density. And in particular, there's a larger cross section than the one that was just determined for fermions. If uh, you have final state involving uh, vector bosons, W and Z, or if you have Higgs in the final state, and also if you have a new heavier. Uh, fermion. So typically, as more and more channels open, the cross section increase. It means that you can allow for smaller, smaller coupling. So it can also be if the dominant process is annihilation into W, for example, you can start to uh, decouple, decouple the process which is responsible for dark matter production with the one that is responsible for direct detection because the one from direct detection basically uh, requires uh, interaction with the Higgs or with the Z. And we'll see that in the specific case of uh, supersymmetry, we can also have contribution from T-channel diagram. 
So for example, we will have, we'll, we'll see that annihilation of neutralino into W pair with exchange uh, of a star genome. And this, uh, this channel in particular can be uh, strongly enhanced when there's a small, small mass splitting, hence it, hence it will lead to very efficient annihilation. And my final point, and this is uh, important because it is comes out, uh, come out always in supersymmetry, you can have co-annihilation. What is coannulation? This is only possible where you have many new particles in the dark sector with exact, uh, nearly the same mass. So let me just say in a few words about uh, coannulation. Coannulation, suppose that you have a dark matter particle here, the LSP in SUSY, and you have the next to lightest supersymmetric particle. Then you, can, you will have annihilation process involving LSP sorry, and NLSP into standard model particle. This LSP and NLSP will be maintained in thermal equilibrium because they interact with standard model. Therefore, the relic density will depend on the rate for all processes, annihilation of dark matter into standard model and in annihilation into, of LSP and NLSP into standard model and uh, even annihilation of two NLSP into standard model. So basically, one has to generalize the equation for the number density. Now, in uh, writing it for each of the of the component uh, of each of the LSP and LSP, etc., and then you you just sum all possible process. Well, it has been shown that actually this set of equation is equivalent to the simple equation I had written before for the number density of the LSP. The only difference is that in here in this expression, the sigma v now is an effective sigma v, which involves the sum over all possible uh, sub process of the type chi chi prime chi prime chi prime, etc multiply by uh, this ratio of their, of their number density to the equilibrium density. And when you look more carefully, then the ratio of this, the number density to the total number density is actually proportional to exponential minus delta m over t. So of course, if there's a large mass splitting, the, the, the contribution for possible coannulating particle is completely negligible when, when there's a small mass splitting you can have a contribution for many other process. One important assumption is this, that all, all these new uh, supersymmetric particles will eventually decay to uh, the LSP. So this is what justified that when you calculate the relative intensity, you sum over all possible process. Although the only important one are those involving particles that are close in mass to the LSP. So typically, if you have a comparable cross-section for then for the annihilation of NSP, you need a few percent mass splitting to, to have a contribution for co-annihilation process. It can be even a bit larger than this if the co-annihilation process is much more efficient than the LSP annihilation process. So typically it will lead to a reduction of the relic density and that's what we see mostly in the case of neutralino supersymmetry. But in principle, it's also possible that coordination process being less efficient when you take the sum and average, you end up with increasing the relic density. So why is that important? So if coordination exists, it will uh, contribute to the relic density, but these coordination involve partic a new particles that have decayed now. So they're not present for participating or in direct detection or in dark matter annihilation in the galaxy. So it means that you can have it, you can uncorrelate the prediction of the relic density from the one for the di direct detection rate. So in this way, you can have much suppressed direct detection rate. Okay, so enough for general statements, which, uh, and let me just uh, go see now how it works in the uh, minimal supersymmetric standard model. Okay, I just wrote a few transparency, but I think you have heard many talks on supersymmetry, so I'll be very brief here. Just remind you that supersymmetry, which, which relates uh, fermions and boson, predicts a lot of new supersymmetric particle. Um, and it, it is, it, as I said before, one of the strong points of supersymmetry as far as dark matter 
is the fact that in a supersymmetric model, you have this uh, quantity, which is called R parity, that was introduced to suppress uh, proton decay, which was uh, governed by processes of this, this type. So if you introduce this R parity with R equal one for uh, cylinder model particle and R equal one to minus one for supersymmetry, well, the, then the lightest supersymmetric particle is stable. And therefore, it could be a suitable dark matter candidate if this particle is neutral. So the minimal supersymmetric standard model is basically the minimal field content. It has the partner of standard mod model particles and, and two Higgs tablet. So we are the standard model particle and the supersymmetric partner. And the neutral particle are basically the partners of the U1 and SU2 gauge boson, as well as the partner of the Higgs. So the neutralino, which is a mixture of these, uh, of these uh, Gaginos and Higginos can be um, the dark matter particle. It's a Majorana fermion. There's another neutral particle here in the spectrum in this neutrino. And in the second lecture, I will come back to uh, this possibility of having this neutrino as dark matter. I don't want to get into the details of, 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 the, of the MSSM, but just to mention that you can write uh, the most large general Lagrangian, which uh, violate uh, supersymmetry because it has to be broken without disturbing consolation of quantitative divergence. And you end up with a total of uh, 22 uh, new parameters, assuming that there is no flavor structure. These are the gauge genome masses, the fermion masses, the parameter of the Higgs sector, and the trilinear couplings listed here. What is relevant for the following discussion is uh, more specifically the neutralino mass matrix. So this neutralino mass matrix has four components, as I said before, and it basically the nature of the LSP, which will in be interesting for us for that matter, is determined by the smallest parameter in this uh, mass matrix. So it can be either the Bino mass M1, uh, the Wino mass M2, or the Higgsino parameter mu. When uh, mu is the uh, mu or m2 are the smallest param parameters, we end up with cases where uh, the uh, neutralino mass or the LSP mass can be very almost degenerate with. Uh, the charge, the charge genome mass, which is a charge par partner of the gauge, bo gauge boson. Um, so there's a neutral genome mass matrix, which is given in terms of these four components, and it's basically what is determined the nature of the uh, of the neutral genome LSP and governs all of its interaction with the standard model particle. So to be more precise, uh, let me write down the charge genome mass matrix, which depends on this M2 MU parameter. So it has a gauge genome component and a Higgs genome component. So clearly you can see that if uh, the neutral genome is governed by M2 MU, it has uh, also a charge genome of about the same mass. We also know that there is a, a limit uh, on the charge genome that was uh, uh, posed by um, Lep Collider a long time ago, and it's basically a, about 100 uh, GV. This indirectly gives you a bound on mu and M2. It does not say anything about M1 in general. So there, it gives a limit on the lightest neutralino only if you assume some relation between M2 and M1, as in the case in many supersymmetric models. So as I said, if the LSP is a Higgs -ino or Wino, there will be a small mass meeting with the lightest charge -ino. And the uh, uh, neutralino charge -ino coupling to the W, which can uh, contribute to dark matter annihilation, will proceed through this Higgs -ino or Wino component. So let's take a bit of a uh, quick look at the neutralino couplings. As I said, neutralino is a mixed, mixed state. So, um, and whether it's a Bino, a Wino, or a Higgs Bino will determine its uh, annihilation property and therefore will lead to a wide range of prediction for dark matter. So the LSP 
will couple to the Z through his Wino component. This is written here. And to the Higgs through the mixture between a Higgs Eno or a Gage Eno uh, component here. A pure state does not couple to the Higgs. So here's the coupling to the lightest Higgs, and here's the coupling to the pseudo-scalar Higgs. I did not write this fermion fermion LSP coupling, but it's basically a coupling that is dependent on the uh, gauge in a component. And for the partner of the right handed uh, fermion, it has to be proportional to the uh, U1 hypercharge. OK, so typical diagrams that could contribute to neutrally no annihilation, depending on the nature of the LSP, could be, and the mass spectrum, could be annihilation into fermion to uh, fermion exchange or to uh, Z, uh, Z or Higgs exchange, or annihilation into W pairs to, for example, uh, charge Eno exchange. So this process is uh, typically much more efficient and tends to lead to much higher cross-section, hence to a much lower relic density. So uh, a bit more about the LSP annihilation. Uh, just a few comments about Bino annihilation into fermion pair. It basically requires, um, it happens, of course, for any value of this fermion mass, but to have efficient enough annihilation, you require light fermion and light LSP because the cross section is proportional to the mass of the LSP square or mass of this fermion to the fourth. So eventually you run into problem because these masses can be too small because you have calendar, their constraint. So to increase the mass of the Bino L LSP, generally it is done through coannulation effect with, for example, fermions. We, as I mentioned before, that uh, resonance and annihilation near a resonance uh, can uh, significantly in, uh, lead to a much larger cross section. So this also means that if you're close to a resonance, you need a smaller coupling of the neutralino to the Higgs. It means that you can afford a small Bino Higgs Eno mixing. Okay, now let's just make again a few comments about uh, the, um, the relic density of neutralino. And let me just simplify the discussion and consider that the only parameters that are relevant for the neutral are from the neutralino sector, then that, that all its fermions are heavy. So we don't have significant contribution for its fermion, no coagulation. And just I just want to uh, uh, give you a feeling of what is what kind of, of, of neutralino gives you the right value for the relic density. So here, what I show you is the evolution of the relic density with the component of the uh, neutralino. So on the left, for example, this is a pure B no. Oops. Here, I, I vary the, the value of, of, of uh, uh, M1 and M2 and mu, so that here, it's the pure Bino has changed into a pure Reno with the Higgs Eno component being negligible. Same here in this section, the, I change a pure Bino in a pure Higgs Eno by tuning in the Higgs Eno component and back into the Reno. So you see that if you take the example of a, a rather light LSP of, a, of the under the weak scale, 150 GeV. If it's a pure Bino, it tends not to annihilate very efficiently because it cannot be helped for fermion, which are very heavy. As soon as you start putting in a little Wino component or a little Higgsino component, it, it's, you, can, uh, you can get the right annihilation cross section to get the correct relic density. But as soon as you start increasing more, the, either the we know the Higgs Eno component, you see that the relic density is too small. So typically, if you have a large Higgs Eno or Wino component, dark matter will be underabundant unless it becomes heavier. So for example, for one, this is the same exercise with a one TeV dark matter. And you see that typically for a, a, a pure Higgs Eno, you get the correct relic density if it's one TeV. To get the correct relic density for the pure we, we know you would have to go rather to 2 TV or above. So this is just to, so that you remember a few, a few number. In general, uh, the neutral LSP uh, will be uh, 
subdominant dark matter component unless it's at the TV scale or it has some important uh, Bino uh, contribution. The problem with this, I come back to my uh, to the, the point that I'm trying to make that there's a strong correlation between relic density and direct detection. If you, you, you do the same exercise, but now look at the prediction for the direct detection. So this is the direct detection cross-section and these lines are the experimental result for uh, exclusion for 150 GeV dark matter. This is an old plot, so you have old result from LUX. You should keep just the current limit, which is given by this line here. So again, if you take, for example, the green line, this is just a variation of uh, 150 dark matter. Here it's a pure hexino, here it's a, a pure uh, bino. And you see that most of it, in fact, all of this now is excluded by xenon one ton. And just to remind you, this is the value that gave you the relic density. So excluded by several orders of magnitude. Same thing if you have a wino hexino, most of it is excluded. But if you see here the tiny, if you have a bino wino, then it's not, if it was absolutely pure, it would be nearly zero, but it's not absolutely pure. So it has a very tiny direct detection cross section. So this is what you need to do to escape uh, direct detection cross section. Uh, it's much easier if you have a heavier dark matter, as I showed before. So if you look, just look at the green line here, this is the same exercise as before. It's just varying the mixing between the hexino and the bino. And you see that in all this region, you have the correct relic density. Part of it is excluded by xenon one ton, but part of it is still allowed. Okay, so uh, the bottom line of this message is if you put the relic density and the direct detection constraints, basically you favor neutralino at TV scale or mix Bino Wino, or you uh, uh, can also just say that you, that you can accept the fact that neutralino would be underabundant and you require an additional dark matter candidate to explain dark matter. I don't like too much this hypothesis, but it, 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 it means that the, the neutralino can still be viable. So is this completely general? Is, are they way out of these arguments? There are. So you can uh, use your theoretical input and impose specific condition on the spectrum. I've mentioned that before. For example, if you take a Bino LSP, it tends not to uh, annihilate efficiently enough to get the correct relic density, but you can use a special mechanism to reduce it, either require that it has, it's not absolutely pure Bino, but it has a small component couples to the Higgs and its mass is very near the mass of the Higgs over two, or you can, um, you can uh, require that you have some other uh, spermion that for some reason has a mass that is very close to the Bino LSP and helps its annihilation. There's also the possibility of reducing the dark direct detection constraint by because there are blind spots in direct detection. There can be cancellation between, for example, standard model Higgs and another Higgs, or there can be at some point there could be con cancellation between standard model Higgs and, and, and squark diagram. I think it's not possible anymore. Okay, so one problem by saying that neutrino dark matter is at TV scale is a problem with supersymmetry is that uh, electoric naturalness will impose that mu is uh, not too large. And the reason for that is there's a fine tuning issue because the Z mass is related to mu and the value of uh, these uh, MHUMHD that appear in the uh, supersymmetric Lagrangian that I showed before. And unless mu is of the order of a few hundred GeV, then uh, you need large cancellation between these two, two terms. Okay, but these are cons uh, uh, theoretical considerations that you should uh, keep in mind. So now let us look and what is allowed for, I just gave you before some specific example. Now let's just look what is allowed by uh, doing a general scan of the minimal supersymmetric standard model. Here I show you one result where it's a, a supersymmetric standard model with 11 parameters. So there are some, um, um, 
some uh, assumptions about the underlying parameters. For example, there is a relation, if I'm not, if I remember correctly, there's a relation between M1, M2, and M3. Some of the trilinear couplings are taken to zero, et cetera. Okay, so here is uh, what is the allowed parameter space in the space of uh, direct detection cross-section. And you should superimpose here, the, uh, the current limits are here and future projections are over there. So what I want you to uh, remember is uh, look at the color code. So you see that first of all, some, some of the region is already excluded ab above this line and a lot is uh, still allowed. But what's interesting is if you look at the color code, you see that the what is allowed corresponds to most of the time, some of these special mechanism that I talk about. So you can either have some slept on coannulation, star coannulation, Luino coannulation, squark coannulation, stop coannulation. Bottom line, you need some kind of coannulation. There can also be some, uh, some uh, charge in no coannulation. This actually it's in most of the region. This is what happened. And is basically typical of the case where you have some kind of um, some important we know or Higgs in no component. Typically, you all get these coannulation. And there's also a small region where you have annihilation through a Higgs funnel. So basically, dark matter is already confined to a special uh, region. And the other point that you should note is that there's still the possibility that actually direct detection is not a useful constraint because uh, even in the future, it won't be a useful constraint because part of the parameter space lies below the uh, neutrino floor. Uh, Professor Bilaje, I have a yes. question. Uh, so uh, is uh, all this region that you are showing, uh, which comes after coannihilation is allowed by relative density or it's underabundant? Um, I, okay, I wouldn't say, want to say something. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure of what was done in this paper. Mm. I think, because... I think it's not underabundant, but I'm not sure. I, we would need to check, check there. Okay. All right. Okay. Since Melissa is talking after me, I will skip this. And I just wanted to make, uh, another, uh, uh, more a specific statement about the light neutrino dark matter. If you lo look here at this, um, it more or less stops around 100 than, or a, a little bit below 100 uh, GeV, around 60 GeV. But there's definitely the question, is it possible to go to still have dark matter, which is lighter than this uh, 60 uh, GeV? In that region, for sure, we know that the neutrino should be dominantly Bino because there's there's a, if it's a Higgs, you know, or we know this this is bound by left that I've uh, told you about, and also it is necessary to relax the unification condition on the gauge you know, mass because this the uh, gauge you know, is unified the high scale basically you have at low scale m one about half m two. So uh, 100 GV limits translate into uh, roughly a 50 GV or so limit. Okay, so this is interesting to see, can, is it still possible to have a light neutralino relaxing these, uh, these constraints? So for sure, if you have a light neutralino, it would need to couple to either a Z or Higgs for efficient enough annihilation. Why is that? Because all the other charged particles, including its fermions are above 100 GV, so they cannot be used for coannulation. So actually, if you look at um, what is possible for, um, uh, if you impose a relic density, if you impose a relic density upper bound on the light neutralino, and you make a scan of the specific scan on 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 this parameter space, you end up with uh, this here in the plane of the uh, prediction for the spin independent cross section as function of the neutralino mass, and you see that almost everything is excluded by direct detection. This is because you need by definition of a coupling to the Z or the Higgs. So you have this, you're exactly into this case where you're, there's a strong correlation between relic density constraint and direct detection constraint. And basically you see that 
there's two possibilities for the mass of the light neutrino is around 45 GeV and it annihilates through Z, or it's around 60 GeV and it's annihilate through Higgs. So if it annihilates through Higgs, there is still currently some uh, allowed region, but it will be soon probed by uh, upgrade of the xenon detector. At the same time, you should know that if it couples, if it's light, definitely it will also uh, contribute to the Higgs physics, to the Higgs invisible decay, or to the Higgs into two photons. Okay, uh, here would be a good point to stop. So maybe I should take a few questions and you tell me if you want to take a, few, a short break or if we go on. Yeah, I think some questions, uh, uh, so whether uh, you can really encourage to, to, to the answers. Yeah, to uh, okay. So I, I, uh, there was a question uh, uh, which, which was actually about that, uh, 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 so it's Shubhajit who is asking, could you kindly explain why the DMDD, I guess this is the dark matter direct detection, spin independent and spin dependent experimental sensitivity curves are parabolic in nature. So this was one of the questions. Okay. So there's actually, there's two, two phenomena. So one he, here at the, at the low mass, actually here is just that you lose sensitivity because as I said, if you have a very light dark matter with, which is highly non-relativistic, uh, you can, you can, uh, you have its um, velocity distribution and you can compute on a specific uh, nuclei what is, what is the minimal energy that it can uh, that it can give to the to the nucleus? And actually, uh, if you have once you go to lower lower mass, you it drops below the threshold of the detector. So this is just a technical uh, detector threshold issue. If you could have a better detector with a better threshold, this you could you could cover uh, this region. But you will also be faced with a loss of sensitivity as to go to lower mass eventually. In the other direction, this is different. It is because the, the signal, you see the rate here depends on rho over, uh, over m chi. So as, the, as, the, as you increase the mass, the signal rate just goes down. So this is why it is basically a straight line. It just goes like 1 over m. Sure, may I ask a question? Yes, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. sure. Please Hi, Genevieve. So yeah. uh, I, I just have a quick question. So, uh, so as you can see, like uh, the sensitivity plot. So if I consider the kind of extended SUSY model beyond MSSN, so how much room really do we have for say singlino dominated uh, neutralino as a dark matter, which is in the below 100 GeV? And especially, you know, keeping it safe from the neutrino flow. Like, uh, is there any kind of mechanism or some uh, modified search strategies where you can actually have some nice information about such a low, pure singlino like dark matter? If you don't mind, we wait after the second lecture because I have okay. sure, transparency sure, sure, sure. on okay, that. Okay, okay, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. So, is there any other question? that we can take up. Yeah, I think it's about the students, they can uh, type the questions and you can, if you yes. feel like a, a, a combining two, three questions at what, one time and let it go. Yes, right. yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. it's fine. Yeah, so we, uh, I mean, all this basically means that we encourage questions from everybody. Yeah. But yes. you please ask, and uh, I mean, uh, you can type your questions in the chat box, which I can read out to the speaker, and yeah. she will be extremely happy to answer them. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've talked a lot about relic density and direct detection. And for supersymmetry, of course, collider can play a very important role because there are lo lots of new particles that can be produced at the LHC. So let me talk a little bit about this direction. 
and how it affects um, supersymmetry. So the LHG is a PP collider that has run at 8.13 and soon to run at close to 14. And the largest production section, of course, are four-colored and charged particle. Neutral particle, unfortunately, leave no signature except for missing uh, transverse energy. So if you want to produce directly uh, dark matter in a model independent way, you have to uh, somehow use an extra particle. So for example, uh, monojet, where you radiate a gluon or quark from the initial state. Or it can be uh, a gauge bosons or a Higgs or whatever. There are, of course, many other signatures for uh, supersymmetry with uh, a sign for dark matter as missing transverse energy. For example, you produce some new uh, colored particle, it decays and it leaves, leads to missing transverse energy plus digest dielepton, lepton, B just stops multi lepton, et cetera, et cetera. The other possibility to look for dark matter at the Lecce is through the invisible decays of the Higgs. Of course, this is relevant only if the uh, mass of dark matter is less than half the mass of the Higgs. And there are other possible searches for uh, new particles, in, par in particular those involving uh, charge track and the space vertex that are relevant for long lived next to lightest uh, particle. It can happen for the, the charge you know in supersymmetry. It requires uh, either small mass splitting, which will happen typically in supersymmetry, or very weak interactions. And you can also search for new particles. So for example, in supersymmetry, you can search for a new Higgs through its standard model final states. So the two search modes that I've written in blue clearly are not gives, don't give you direct information on dark matter, and you cannot certainly cannot claim dark matter discovery if you see a new particle in these channels. But it will give you some information on the underlying new physics model. The ones in green are more uh, a sort of generic model independent search for dark matter, and so, but they involve typically uh, weakly interacting particles, so the rates can be lower. And it turns out that in supersymmetry, super this monojet actually turns out to be very useful, not only for the production of uh, neutralino, but also in the case of a very compressed spectrum where you have very small mass difference, for example, between a stop and the neutralino, and you don't really see, um, uh, you don't really see the, um, the uh, outgoing particle. So you see, you see it at, at uh, missing transverse energy. And uh, you see just the, 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 the monojet signature. So the typical supersymmetric uh, signature will be here through these multiple signs of standard model particle coupled with missing transverse energy. Why well, I can't change. OK. This is what I just said in this transparency. This is the typical traditional search for dark matter at the Lecce, where you produce a new particle, typically colored or charged, and it decays eventually into dark matter. So example are searches for quark, it will decay into quark neutralino. Gluino will decay into quarks and one neutralino, as well as more complicated decay. For example, what it can be a long chain decay, but eventually there will always be missing first energy corresponding to the neutralino, even if the decay goes into several steps as into two ex these two ex um, examples. So right now we have very strong limits on squarks and gluino uh, around over, over two, two TeV and weaker limits for third generation. But this is not really related to dark matter. I mean, you can, you can make the squark and gluino or, uh, uh, with masses greater than 2 TV, and you can still have a light dark matter. And you won't learn anything through this process because you just don't have energy to produce the squark and the gluino. What can be more directly relevant for dark matter, if you remember the global plot I showed you before, I sh showed you cases where you had many regions where you had co-annihilation contribution to dark matter. So in a sense, looking at this region is very important. So for example, the stop, 
will be important for the dark matter, principally if it contributes to coannulation. So if when you look at results for search for stop, this is the this is an example for Atlas for limits, current limits on stop versus the neutralino mass. So the best limit is, is over 1.2 TeV if the neutralino is very heavy. This doesn't, this would, if a signal would be uh, found in this region, it wouldn't tell us that much about the dark matter property. What is more relevant for dark matter is what I trace here, this black line. So this, when you're along this line, there's an important contribution of the stop to uh, the coannulation process. And what is very uh, good is that you see that with the recent search, the sensitivity has improved quite a bit along this line. And now stop and neutralino around uh, close to 600 GV are, uh, are, uh, are, be are being excluded. So th this is a brand new result with the full uh, luminosity of uh, run two. So what is more, Relevant for dark matter search as LXC is direct process involving neutralinos, uh, uh, electroweak inos. So basically, you have charged inos production. So uh, if the sleptons are, are not uh, too, too heavy, this can be the, the dominant search mode where you have two leptons missing energy or more leptons and missing energy. You can have charged ino and neutralino to production. But in some cases, you have actually the dominant process is neutrally no charge, no uh, production with decay into a Z and a dark matter, a W into dark matter or Higgs into dark matter. So these are uh, the processes that uh, can be hard, uh, can uh, that, that basically have uh, the weakest constraints. So these are two results for the search for um, charging on neutralino at the LHC. This one on the left is from 2017, and the one on the right is for, for the um, uh, full luminosity of, of run two. So um, in just what I wanted to show here is that, uh, first of all, I want you to note is first of all, uh, in different channels, the best limits are, are around 600 GV. The region where the neutralino and the charge no is somewhat compressed are the limits are much weaker. And just what I wanted to, to show also is illustrate that with the full uh, luminosity at the 13 TV, you gain a lot in uh, sensitivity. And this is typical of any uh, electroweak processes because uh, of the weaker cross section, uh, they benefit a lot from the, uh, uh, from the higher luminosity. I just want to make a comment on also the what what the LHC can do in terms of long link charge particle. It's actually something that is very relevant in supersymmetry because you often have a charge you know with small mass plating with the LS, LSP. It means that you can uh, you can produce a charge you know. You see it in the detector. Then it decay into uh, into the neutralino and a very soft pion, which is undictable. So basically you have a disappearing track illustrated here. I should also remind you at, at this point is that um, the case of the compressed charge, you know, which is basically a charge, uh, this is in situation where you have pure Wino or almost pure Wino or Higgs, you know, um, LSP. Uh, below a TV, it cannot explain all of the dark matter. In this case, you will have underabundant dark matter. Yes, it turns, it's a, yet it is interesting to see that the LHC is starting to put constraints on these kind of, of uh, using this kind of disappearing track. And you see here in the yellow region for very small mass splitting, uh, you find the disappearing tracks and it puts limits uh, for uh, a pure Higgs, you know, up to about uh, uh, 200, uh, 200 GeV. There's also uh, uh, some searches for heavy, heavy stable charged particle where actually you can have lifetime of uh, even up to uh, 10, uh, up to uh, 10 meter or, or even longer particle that actually uh, cross the detect detector. 
I remind you also that finding a charged long lived particle is definitely not a direct probe of dark matter, but it gives you some information of supersymmetry. Okay, after mentioning these few things that can be done for uh, LHC search for dark matter, I like to show you this result, which is actually it's an old result, it's from run one, but it's a compilation. It's interesting because it's a compilation of all Atlas searches. I couldn't find the same one done for, for uh, run two. But it, it gives you an idea of what can be uh, done and what kind of searches have cont contribute to, um, to uh, LHC searches. So all of them I have mentioned before, searches for missing energy and, and multiple particle, monojet searches, searches for stops, <coughs> also searches for disappearing tracks or long lived particles, searches for heavy heat and all kinds of other searches. So when you combine all this, this is what you get. What is left after LHC run one? So on the left is all the prediction for um, uh, PMSSM model where they impose only the upper limit on the relic density. And the, the, uh, this plot is color coded as a function of the nature of the dark matter. So we see in red, we have a Bino, dominantly Bino, it's not pure Bino, but dominantly pure Bino LSP, in green, a uh, Higgsino LSP, and in W, uh, in blue, uh, uh, we know LSP. So in there are summarized all the features we have discussed so far. We see that there's a possibility for uh, a neutralino to be around 45 GV annulate efficiently to a Z, to be around 60 GV annulate efficiently into a W. And this region, when it's a Bino, it's mostly uh, coannulation regions. You see also that if we have a light Higgsino or Wino, they are definitely underabundant, and you need about 1 TV or 2 TV to have a dominantly Higgsino and Wino. On the right is what is left after all these searches of LHC that I've listed in the plot below. So you don't see much different in the global uh, area, but you see that uh, there's a, the, the, the density of point is much lower. So a lot of these points uh, at low masses, for example, have been excluded. And a lot of these points where you have a window know, like uh, LSP uh, has been excluded, for example, from these disappearing track searches. So there are strong constraints on the model, but almost a full mass range for the neutrally no LSP remain possible. Uh, can, could I yes. ask a short question? Uh, yes. Yeah, because this plot is essentially done and for underabundant regions, so it raises the question that if you take into account the direct search constraints together, because the underabundant regions have larger annihilations, if not driven by co annihilations mostly, it will face uh, 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 direct detection constraints uh, even in a stricter way for the underabundant uh, uh, LSD. Uh, okay, so this is a good point. So. It depends, okay, it depends the point of view you want to take. So there's two points I want to make. So first of all, if, if, dark, if the neutralino is under abundant, you can assume two things. You can assume first that you have some modification in the cosmological history and that your calculation of the relic density has been modified. And that in fact, today, the uh, uh, neutralino form all of the dark matter. In that case, what you said is true that the, relic density, uh, the direct detection constraint can be strong. Or you can say that, okay, I have a neutrally no dark matter, but I have some other dark matter component. Even in SUSY, there are many other possibilities for dark matter. I can have the gravity, no, I can have the axis, no, I can have other stuff. And then it means that the direct detection constraint should be scaled by the fraction of uh, dark matter. It means that if you assume that you have only uh, 100 of the of the relic density is explained by the neutral dark matter, you scale your direct detection limit by 100. And therefore, uh, it's not it's not always obvious that because your dark matter is underabundant, you have a stronger direct detection uh, cross section. Moreover, we have seen that dark matter, uh, for example, for the case of the pure we know, 
the dark matter annihilation actually goes through either coannihilation with charge you know, or annihilation into W pairs. And they're not really, doesn't involve the coupling through the Higgs. So basically in the pure Wino case, I remind you that there is basically no direct detection constraint. So there's not, it's not absolutely, there's not direct relation with the fact that the relic density is very small, necessarily implies a higher value for the direct detection. Okay, yeah, let okay, me thank you, thank you, yeah. Okay, let me continue. Uh, this I just wanted to show you here. It's basically the same global fit I have shown you before, but it includes some of the result of run two. So <laughs> this is the only reason I wanted to show, to show you that, but it's basically the same. It is done in a, a constrained MSSM where it's assumed that there's only one gauge genome mass. So there's only seven free parameters, but you see the more or less the same feature when you look at the cross section for spin independence as a function of the mass with the different color codes. So basically what is allowed is typically coannihilation or annihilation through a heavy Higgs funnel. And you have a small region where you have around uh, 50 and, and 60 GeV. And you see that there's a lot of, uh, which is below the neutrino floor so that the direct detection could not explain anything about that. Okay, so to summarize this part about the MSSM, the direct detection uh, experiment strongly constrained the WIP model, especially when you couple to the relic density constraint. But it is possible to escape all these constraints even beyond the reach of the future de detector. I have not had the opportunity to talk too much about the spin dependent interaction because they're typically less sensitive, but nevertheless, in some cases, they offer complementary probes. The LHC has significantly reduced the SUSY parameter space for the neutralino dark matter, but uh, there are still a possibility. And it is good to know that with higher luminosity, it definitely will improve sens sensitivity for uh, electroweak kino search, which are more directly uh, related to dark matter. So this is my summary for the MSSM part. Now I want to uh, discuss probably more briefly of the possibility of going beyond the MSSM. There is first of all, a theoretical reason for that because there are problem with the MSSM. For example, I've mentioned already the naturalness problem or the, the mu problem. So a natural solution for that would, would be the NMSSM and I will give you an example. Another problem with the uh, MSSM or standard model for that matter is that uh, neutrino have masses. So if you want to describe neutrino mass, it would be better to add uh, at least a right-handed neutrino. Therefore, in supersymmetry, it's neutrino. So there's a new possibility for dark matter. There's also the possibility to actually combine these two problems and have a model which is called the mu nu MSSM where you have a dynamic generation of both the, the mu parameter and the neutrino mass. And there's also, of course, the reason that you want eventually to uh, unify all, all interaction. And it's possible that in some of these unified models, you have extended gauge structure. So you have additional, for example, at low scale and additional U1 gauge boson in addition to the MSSM. So the question is now, what is the implication for that matter? Does it allow to alleviate this tension that I have put forward uh, between the relic density measurement and the direct detection con constraint? So I will discuss basically two cases. One is the singly no in the NMSSM and the other one is this neutrino. Okay, so uh, very quickly, the NMSSM, it's uh, the main advantage is that um, by adding a new singlet superfield, written here, you can uh, uh, generate this, uh, the mu parameter, and it's directly related to the VEV of this uh, singlet sphere. So it's naturally, uh, it's naturally at the weak scale. Of course, the M NMSSM contains the MSSM, so in the limit lambda goes to zero, uh, you would recover the MSSM and you would decouple the singlet sector. From the dark matter point of view, what is interesting is that basically in this model, you have the possibility to have very light singlet Higgses, even below the mass of the Higgs that we have discovered. And you have the possibility of having a singly no dark matter. And in particular, 
In particular, this Singlino can be light. Uh, just so that you can follow the discussion with the uh, couple of new parameters, let me just uh, remind you what is the Higgs sector. So, because in this sector you have two Higgs doublet plus and sing a singlet, the physical Higgs contains three pseudo sc three scalars and two pseudo scalars. Uh, I rem the, remind you that the new parameter is related to the web of the singlet. And basically, this is uh, a soft term in the potential with all these new parameters. We have lambda, kappa, a lambda, a kappa, as well as the parameters of the MSSM, which are now tangent beta and mu. So for dark matter, the neutralino, we basically have the mass matrix of the MSSM here and adding a new column with terms proportional uh, to lambda. So if lambda goes to zero, the uh, singly no completely decouple, and we have here the singly no state. So the LSP now has, in addition to the B no, we know Higgs in a component, a singly no component. And in the limit lambda goes to zero, the singly no is an uh, almost pure state. Now, so we can now have a modification of how the LSP couples to Higgs. So we have here the terms, the normal term for the coupling of the LSP to, to the Higgs and the MSSM, but we have additional terms that are proportional to the singly no component, this N15, and also another term which is proportional to the singlet component of the Higgs. And that couples through a term which is proportional to lambda and the Higgs no component of the Higgs or the singly no, um, Higgs no component of the neutralino or its singly no component. So if you look at the dark matter in a MSS and MSSM, it's globally very similar to the MSSM when the neutralino is either B no, Higgs no, or we know, but there are new possibilities because it can be a singly no. So let me focus only on these new possibilities. And basically there are new channels for dark matter. Dark matter can now annihilate into light Higgses because if the sing this because the singlet is partly decoupled, the singlet can be light and can even be below 125 GeV. And there's also possibility for dark matter to annihilate through the singlet Higgs through the coupling that I've just sh shown you. So there can still be some resonance effects and enhanced annihilation even if the uh, even if the singly no is very light, provide its mass is close to half the mass of the singlet. So basically, the new thing is that with the singlet singly no, you open the possibility for uh, for neutrally no for masses below the 40 GeV that we had found in the MSSM. And this is, is illustrated here in the scan of parameter space. This is the, the mass of the neutrally no. Here is the mass of the charge no. This, the, in here, the worry mostly about fine tuning, but let's forget that for the moment. Just for the dark matter, we see what happened. We have possibility of dark matter around 45 GV, around 60 GV, as well as the possibility of much lighter dark matter. So let's look at that a bit closer. Uh, and this, um, I hope, will answer the previous question on the light singlet dark matter. So this is the result for a, a dedicated scan of the parameter space of the NMSSM in the region where the neutralino mass is le less than 60 GeV. Remember, I showed you such, such picture in the framework of the MSSM, and most of it was ruled out by direct detection. But here we see that if we have a, a singly no dark matter, we add the singly no dark matter, and we have we add light Higgses, there's a lot more possibility for uh, dark matter below 60 GV and including for dark matter below 10 GV. Basically, this is possible only this very light, uh, very light uh, singlino dark matter. It's possible only when the singlino allays through a singlet resonance. And with this, you easily reach, you easily go down to, uh, to the GV scale. Again, uh, I have this question. So is it underabundant region of parameter space which is being plotted? Okay, so here you notice that, as in other plot, but I forgot to mention, is that here is the spin independent cross section times this parameter Xi. The parameter Xi is denotes the fraction of um, of the relic density that is of the neutral node. So for example, if um, 
if the overlay density is 0.01, C mm -hmm. would be just 10%. So this is folded, folded in. So of course, so it allows in this scans, you have both the case where uh, the single node is exactly uh, produced exactly the correct relic density, as well as the case where the exino is underabundant. Okay. Yeah. It's complete. Both cases are completely covered, and this is sort of folded in in the uh, in the plot here, so that you you see directly what can be uh, excluded by direct detection, even if there's some additional dark matter component. So you see here the okay, all points that do not satisfy xenon one ten have been removed, and you see what could be covered by xenon n ten and what is below this coherence scattering. So you see that in many, many cases, you're much below. Yeah, so uh, this uh, this plot, uh, the color code is not in terms of the fraction of the relic density that it constitutes of the total relic, but no. in terms of uh, some branching ratio. Of... Yeah, I, this this was my, going to be my next point. So okay. sorry, I have the equivalent plot in terms of, of, of the fraction of the dark matter, but I choose to show you the invisible Higgs because okay. I wanted to make the point that if you start to add many new particles at low scale, so the singly no, you need a, you need a singlet Higgs with a mass close to twice the mass of the singly no, it's either the scalar or the pseudo scalar, then you have a lot of new state that contribute to invisible Higgs. It can decay into the singly no pair, can be, decay into a light Higgs, light pseudoscalar, maybe even sometime into a uh, 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 neutralino one, neutralino two, or it could decay, um, and you can have additional uh, additional decays. I'm actually, I'm not sure which else are available. Anyway, uh, the branching of the in invisible Higgs therefore gives you a handle on this uh, parameter space. So here are the color code shows the invisible width, including all these intermediate states. And the color code is such that black here, uh, in black is all the points where the invisible Higgs is less than 0.24%. Why we chose this value? Because this is the value that is projected to be measurable at a future E plus E minus collider. So it means that so some of these points are reachable through a measurement of the invisible Higgs, but some are not. So there are still issues on how to pro probe these uh, very light neutralinos. Spin dependent can offer complementary probes in the high mass region. So these are accessible at uh, through neutron scattering or through proton scattering, but you see that basically the light masses is not accessible. Okay, so in the last, I don't know how, how much time I have, I wanted to discuss a new, another, maybe about 15 minutes, I want to discuss another dark matter candidate in uh, the MSSM is the neutrino dark matter. So my first point is that the partner of the left-handed neutrino is that we found in the MSSM is not a good dark matter candidate. Why? Because it annihilates, it interacts with the Z, it annihilates very efficiently. And all these couplings involve the gauge coupling. So typically the relic density is very small unless the neutrino is very heavy. And moreover, what's even more critical is because this left-handed neutrino coupled to a Z, it gives actually a very large contribution to direct detection through the exchange. And already in 1995, this was excluded by the direct detection constraint at the time. So the only way you can make the left-handed neutrino uh, part of the dark matter, if it's constitute a small fraction of the dark matter, and then you can evade some of direct detection bound because it contributes only to a fraction of the relic density. But this is require, require another dark matter candidate. So I cannot say, really say that the left-handed neutrino Neutrino, I mean, sorry for the typo, would not be a, a good dark matter candidate because it can only be a small fraction of the dark matter. Okay, but we know that neutrino have masses. So it's uh, one way to have these masses is to introduce a right-handed neutrino and its supersymmetric partner would therefore be very well motivated. Then the question, can this neutrino be the dark matter? So first of all, this neutrino is a singlet. Can it be in thermal equilibrium? For this, you need 
some kind of interaction with the uh, standard model or the MSSM. So there are several ways to do that. One way is to assume that there's some, some non-negligible left-right mixing. This can be, so this is the left-right mixing matrix. If you have a large A term, this will induce a significant uh, mixing between the uh, singlet neutrino and the left-handed neutrino. In this way, the neutrino will couple to Z and to the Higgs, and therefore we'll have the usual, uh, uh, we have to, to work with the usual tension between relic density and direct detection. But this is some example of uh, a work that showed that this it was uh, com compatible with, um, part of the parameter space is compatible with relic density direct detection, as well as uh, satisfying all of LHC constraints. There's other way to do this without getting into details. You can have, for example, new gauge interaction. So some years ago, we worked on, on a model where you, extract, uh, you had the MSSM with an extra U1 symmetry, as well as this neutrino dark matter. Uh, and, and the coupling of the mediator uh, of the neutrino to the, to the standard model took place through a, a new Z prime or through scalar Higgs. And it turns out that the neutrino could be uh, dark matter. Uh, people have also looked at the uh, NMSSM, adding a neutrino to the NMSSM. And then it is the singlet that we've talked about that plays the role of the, of the mediator. And because the singlet can be light, again, we fall in the situation where this neutrino uh, can be light. So all these models are, are for the moment viable with respect to LHC constraints and they feature new signature because you have a neutrino LSP rather than a neutrino LSP. But what I really I wanted to spend a few minutes to discuss is the other possibility where the, the case where this neutrino is actually not in thermal equilibrium in the standard model because its interactions are too weak. So let me just make a couple of general comment about feebly interacting ma massive particle. And the process that help that con that make uh, generates the relic density of dark matter is uh, so called freezing. So what happened is that the universe in the early universe, this uh, neutralino or neutrino is so feebly interacting that it's not in uh, thermal equilibrium. It's completely discoupled from from the plasma. So you can even assume that there's zero density at the beginning. It couples to the standard model to some kind of uh, mediator. And what happens is that if you look at the uh, normal Boltzmann equation for relic density production, we had two terms. One, which was due to the deplet depletion of, uh, of dark matter due to annihilation, and one, the creation of dark matter from the inverse process. Well, in the case of freezing, you basically, this does not happen because you don't have enough uh, uh, dark matter particles. And basically you just have the inverse process where you create uh, dark matter from either from scattering or from decay of some other heavier particle in equilibrium with the standard model. And basically this is the general picture of the abundance and how it's evolved as function of uh, one over T. So basically you start with uh, no dark matter and it's uh, slowly produced until um, um, until the number density of the standard model becomes Boltzmann suppressed. And therefore, uh, there's no other process to, no more process to form dark matter and it, it's, uh, its abundance uh, stabilized. So contrary to the freeze out process where the larger the annihilation cross section, the smaller the radic density, here it goes in the other way. If the, inter the stronger the interaction, the more dark matter you will produce. Uh, just want to notice that usually when the case possible, it's the process that dominate. So there are a few possibilities for uh, feebly interacting massive particle as dark matter. So it can be produced in the annihilation of standard model particle or in the case of some particle in thermal equilibrium. But it can also be that although the FIMP is a dark matter, there the next two lightest supersymmetric particle will freeze out as usual. And because it has a long line time, it will decay to the dark matter, but after the freeze out. So basically in this case, you, you can hope to for collider signature for prediction of stable 
charged particle or at least the space vertices. It's also possible that the feebly interacting particle is not dark matter. It just freezes in and then decays to dark matter. So let me talk a little bit more about these two cases because I want to illustrate how it works for the right-handed neutrino. So let's consider the MSSM and a right-handed neutrino, let's say three generation of neutrino and their uh, partner, and assume they have a pure direct master. So uh, the superpotential will have these new terms involving the, the neutrinos. So uh, the point is that the Yukawa couplings are expected uh, uh, to, to, to be small. And actually, there's a determination of this coupling to be of the order of 10 to the minus 13, assuming that the neutrino mass is saturated the atmospheric neutrino or the cosmological bound with the generic neutrino. So you have a coupling of the order of 10 to minus 13. So it's the typical coupling that you need for a freezing of print. We will assume that this neutrino mass is the same order as other fermions, so it can be the LSP. And there can be mixing between the left and the right neutrino, but this mixing will be, uh, will be typically very small because there's a factor of uh, neutrino mass. Okay, so you can have either dark matter production through, as I said before, annihilation of decay or decays of particle in thermal equilibrium, or from the decay after freeze out or a combination of all processes. So even though annihilation of particles can be very weak, there are actually many, many processes. This is a list of processes that can contribute to this neutrino production. Um, and which dominant ones some, some, somehow uh, depend on the spectrum. In both cases, we have to actually be careful about uh, uh, big band nucleosis is constrained in the sense that if you have some charged particle that is still uh, uh, present when big band nucleosis takes place, it can change the prediction. So just let me give you a specific example where uh, we would have a, a model with a neutrino dark matter that comes from the second process, the decay of the MSSM LSP after freeze out. So the relic density will be obtained from that of the NLSP because it can be charged. So the, the freeze out, say, uh, density of this neutrino will be given by this, just by the ratio of the mass of this neutrino to the, to the mass of the MSSM LSP. And let's consider just for definiteness the case where the stow is the NLSP, so the NLSP is charged. So of course, there are a lot of collider constraints on such model, Higgs, flavor physics, with research as charge table particle, as well as constraint from big band nucleosynthesis because the lifetime of this star can be long enough for decay to happen around or after BBN. So will impact the abundance of light element. In this, in this uh, study that was done here, um, this is just the, just want to give you an idea what these constraints can do. This is sort of the allow parameter space as a function of the lifetime of the NSP of the tau. And this is a sort of the constraint on the visible energy that is produced from the, from the decay. So, uh, so basically if the decay is above uh, 10 to the three second, it's roughly a straight line. And even for a smaller lifetime, you still have a decay that, uh, that uh, constrain this vis ratio of visible energy times yield to be less than 10 to minus 10. OK, but still, there's still the possibility of having a neutrino dark matter in these conditions. Then the question would be how you look for them. First of all, you will have the characteristic nature to be a stable charge particle, not missing in energy. You can have the possibility that the star live from second to minute and decay outside of the detector. So you have to redo all the conventional SUSY searches. For example, the squark searches where you have to decay into neutrino. In this case, the neutrino then decays into the star, then decays into the neutrino. And you have this particle here that is long lived. So in this, uh, uh, in this study, we, uh, we considered a simple model impose some uh, unification relation and show that we actually can uh, probe masses of 
to order 600 GV, depending, of course, on the squawk mass, because if the squawk are very heavy, nothing can be problem. Recall, uh, however, that this limit of the squawk being heavier than two, uh, uh, two TV uh, comes also from similar with missing ET, so they do not apply directly. Other interesting uh, possible signature in these idea in these uh, contexts is also that you can pair produce two stable style, so the style will move behave like a slow muon, and you can look for a stable particle crossing the detector in Atlas or CMS, or you can actually even look for uh, passively search for stable particle with detector that are located outside of um, an interaction region. And that are, for example, there's one called Medal that is sensitive to a highly ionizing uh, particle and basically can detect one such particle that crossed the detector, provided its velocity is uh, before, be, provided it is slow. So we have shown that there's some possibility to probe some of these signature at, at the LHC. Okay. Um, let me just make one or two remarks about indirect detection. This is something I did not talk too much about. And the reason I did not talk too much about is because uh, there was so much to say about direct detection and relic density and collider that are much more effective in, pro in probing um, uh, SUSY dark matter. But let's just make a few comments about indirect detection. Indirect detection, it comes from observation of the decay product of annihilation of pair of dark matter particle in the galaxy. So um, dark matter annihilate produce uh, WZ top bottom, etc., which ionize decay and eventually leads to photons, neutrino, positrons, antiprotons. All of these has been searched for. All of these depend on this annihilation cross section, the sigma V, that we know is typically of the order of three times 10 to minus 26 to produce the correct predict density. However, I should no note. This is very important to, to realize this, is that in the galaxy, typical ve velocity is about 1,000th of, uh, of the light, of the speed of light. But at freeze out, there is some thermal energy. So, and basically, although particles are non-relativistic, uh, average energy can be uh, larger. So if you make a decomposition of sigma v in terms of uh, these a plus b, v squared plus other terms that depend on v4, et cetera, you can see that it's possible that at very small and basically zero luminosity, you can have the sigma v, uh, zero velocity, you can have sigma v, which is smaller than sigma v at freeze out, if the B term dominates in this uh, annihilation process. So for example, for initially no annihilation into fermions, it is the case, it is the B term that dominates. So you can have or indirect detection, weaker cross section than, three, than, than 10 to minus 26. You can on the other hand also have increased cross section for example, at very small velocity, there's something called the Sommerfeld effect that comes from example, where you have exchange of light particle in long range potential. And these can lead to a very much increased cross section at uh, low velocity. There's also possibly possible that dark matter annihilation happens through a resonance. We've seen many examples where it should be the case. And the fact that if the resonance is very narrow, the precise mass difference between the resonance and twice the mass of the uh, of the neutrino is very important because it can be that if you look here, this is the enhancement of the cross section. The oh, okay, uh, I forget what is okay. Here is the relative velocity, but it can be that. You, you have, you're exactly sitting at the maximum of the cross section for indirect detection, while for relic density, there is some thermal average. So you just see part of the resonance. So it means that the 
cross-section for direct detection can be much larger than the cross-section that is required for relic density. And this is a plot of the possible uh, enhancement depending on the mass difference with the LSP. Okay, so I just wanted to make this general remark because they're, they're important to keep in mind when uh, uh, we basically see exclusion. For example, here's the exclusion by a Fermilat in the plane of sigma V as a function of the dark matter mass. And in red, here is this three times 10 to minus 26, which is called the thermal relic cross section. So we see two things. First, assuming that all dark matter annihilate into, into BB bar, the region at masses below 100 GB is basically uh, ruled out. And there could be some additional constraints coming from a heavier mass region, for example, if there's some, some enhancement due to uh, resonance. I will not talk about the gamma ray line here. I just want to make a comment also on uh, other limits coming from dark matter annihilation to antiprotons. The situation here is more complicated because when you look at charged cosmic ray, I mean, you can very much pre pre predict the spectrum in a given final state at the point where you have dark matter annihilation, but there, then there is the particle propagates until it reaches us. It's subject to uh, deviation in the galactic magnetic, magnetic field, et cetera, different process. And basically the spectrum that you see here can be quite different than the one that you see here. And so it's uh, um, introduced a source of uncertainty because it depends on what you assume for uh, the propagation. Therefore, these limits should be taken with some care. And in particular, if you look at Antiprotons. There were at some point a uh, claim that there, there was an excess at high mass. If you compare the observation with the prediction here, assuming some propagation model, but when you start to take into account all uncertainties, you see that actually just the uh, there's really no uh, excess. Just the normal uh, p-bar spectrum uh, can explain basically what is observe. Nevertheless, because the situation has improved and AMS at 0 2 have made uh, in particular measurement of boron to carbon ratio, which are also sensitive to the propagation parameter, it is it has been now possible to refine the constraints on the uh, propagation parameter. And groups have been doing model independent analysis of dark matter constraints, including both adding a component of dark matter with a given sigma v for a given mass and fitting all of this to the propagation parameter, including the data from B, B over C. And using this, one is able to derive strong constraint on dark matter annihilation, although these constraints do depend on your assumption about the propagation parameters, as well as, as about the dark matter uh, density distribution. So this is an example of what can be constrained from uh, antiproton for dark matter annihilating into BB bar. So you see that the constraint can be quite uh, strong as well as into WW, but these constraints definitely depend on what you assume on the uh, dark matter profile, because you see here that now, uh, assuming a less aggressive dark matter density profile and especially a smaller value for the local density, you see that the constraints become uh, much weaker. Okay, so for that reason, because there is this dependence on the on the on the propagation parameters and that um, also on the dark matter profile, uh, I have not in in this talk presented result including. Uh, indirect detection constraints, but certainly it's important to keep in, mat, in mind that there are also constraints on supersymmetric dark matter coming from indirect detection, especially for mass uh, below 100 GeV. I should also say that there have been anomalies observed there, but as far as I'm concerned, it is not clear now whether they are due to dark matter or some astrophysical sources. So for the moment, I don't want to treat that as a signal of dark matter. So to conclude, uh, supersymmetric dark matter is definitely still alive and pursuing WIM search in direct detection and at the LHE will put more tension on the allowed parameter space. I also wanted to uh, point out that 
Neutralino is not the only supersymmetric dark matter. Neutralino is definitely a viable alternative, although it requires an extension of the minimal model. And there are other alternatives, for example, the Gravitino, which I have no time to address in this talk. So now uh, time for some questions. So uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, actually. So yeah, we can take up some questions. Nishita, you may go ahead. Hi, uh, uh So I wanted to ask actually about uh, the run one results that you showed. Uh, yes. And there are there seem to be these points that are very low mass. So I was just wondering what is it that lets them remain? Is it just that uh, the corresponding accompanying strongly charged particles are very heavy? So these guys are never produced at the LHC? I'm, I'm sorry, what are you talking about? You're talking ah, so, about... Yeah, exactly. So there you see there is, uh, you as you pointed out, uh, there's a thinning of phase space, but mm -hmm. you still have things that are, say, 50 GeV that are allowed. So I was yes. just wondering what exactly is it that is still uh, allowing these to remain? Is it just that the accompanying strongly charged particles are too heavy, so these are never produced, or is it something else? Yeah, because they, these these are in a region where you have neutralino relating through either Z or Higgs resonance. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's the only thing you need to get the relic density. So you don't need to get some other uh, particle for contributing to coannulation. So you can live with the rest of the spectrum being very heavy. Okay. And if you if you look at the if you remember, also I showed the uh, a plot of the uh, impact of direct detection for specifically the low mass region, and there uh, it was it was shown. Although the model is may maybe not exactly the same, but it was shown that actually these two region around forty and sixty GV will be probed by direct detection. Right. Okay. Okay. I see. Thanks. Okay, so uh, maybe we can move to the next question. Ritoja, uh, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was uh, just trying to understand the statement about uh, Snutrino. So uh, in the uh, beginning, you mentioned that uh, due to this uh, tension between relic and uh, direct detection, it can be, uh, I mean, a part of dark matter. Uh, but is that uh, still valid uh, when you consider non-standard uh, cosmology like FIMP? I mean, there also, will it only be a part or can it be the full? I don't know. No, wait, 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 wait. No, can, when you consider FIMP, uh, you don't mm -hmm. have to worry too much about direct detection mm -hmm. because the interaction with the Higgs are very, if they are there, they are extremely weak. So mm -hmm. you forget about direct detection. Okay. okay. So and the only thing is you need a FIMP to reproduce dark matter and you have to the only thing you have to worry about is um, uh, this uh, BBN constraint eventually mm -hmm. depending on what else you have in the spectrum mm -hmm. so there's no okay there has not been so complete investigation of the parameter space I showed you the result of one specific study in one specific model and in that case this neutrino could be not 100 percent but at least 50 percent of the dark matter but I'm sure that in uh, in other versions of less constrained model, you can have this neutrino with the full dark matter without any problem. Because okay. there are very few constraints. Basically, the only constraint is relic density and eventually mm -hmm. uh, constraints from colliders on the rest of the spectrum. OK, OK, thank you. OK, <clears throat> is there any other question? Okay, so if not, then let's thank Professor Belarge for, for an excellent overview on supersymmetric dark matter. And- uh, um, thank, yeah. you, thank, you. Yeah. thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much.